Gracias. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to this next episode of the Therapy Show with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. And we're going to be talking about the traumatized client in this week's episode. Yes, we are. And I think the last podcast was also about trauma, but it was more specifically dealing with the trauma of sexual abuse. Um, I do want to talk more, uh, perhaps uh, you know, spread it out into a more generalized area of traumatization. Um, so that's what this podcast is going to be at. And also specific techniques for dealing with trauma is other things I want to talk about. So if we're talking about trauma, I thought, well, I'll go and find out and Google what they talk about in trauma. And uh, they, they brought a really sort of, when I put trauma in, they came up with sort of eight things, uh, which is number one, give yourself time to talk about things. Number two, find out what happened. Number three, get support with other survivors. Well, I'd prefer the word thrivers than survivors, but anyway, um, take some time out for yourself, talk it over with people, get into a routine and do some normal, I don't know what normal, but anyway, normal things with other people. So those all might be coping mechanisms, but I want to talk about the therapeutic approach to trauma. And the therapeutic approach to trauma is to go, go into the trauma and look at how the past affects the trauma. And at the moment, as I'm talking to you, we are in what we would call, I would call a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, with what's happened there. And we, we can see the refugees coming from Afghanistan and we can start looking at the trauma uh, that they will have been through. And of course, if we even go out further, and I, I, I know you know a bit about this, the armed forces, people come back from many places where there's been huge trauma and suffer from post-traumatic stress. And uh, I'd like to talk a bit about that. But trauma, if we look at what trauma is, trauma can be an injury to the psyche, can be an injury to the body, an injury to the mind, an, an invasion of the very soul, and often takes harbour in parts of the psyche and goes into hiding so people can survive and then get triggered by things that can happen in the present in relationships, loud noises, uh, changes in the environment. And then the emotions and the trauma comes out, the person feels overwhelmed and can't function very well. Yeah. And then they go to a therapist or they might go to the doctor and might get medication to try and um, you know, uh, shut that door where the trauma is. Unfortunately, the trauma, a bit like pressure cooker, has to find its way out. And then you get flashbacks and then they go back to to the doctor again so the question is if somebody comes to therapy uh, 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 from a traumatized place talks about they have palpitations they have anxiety they have fear they feel stress they get flashbacks cognitive or emotional uh, that means they can't function and they come to the therapist all those symptoms what does the therapist do well the first step is to help the person talk about their story now you might be in a difficult place because they might say well I don't know uh, the story yeah. and what they mean by that is to deal with the trauma um, they've created layers of um, survival techniques such as dissociation splitting off parts of the trauma where they actually don't remember the trauma or find it very hard to have any cognitive expression of trauma yeah. It doesn't mean that they don't know. It means they're not allow. It means that they're not allowing themselves to know. Yeah. And those those are two different things. Yeah. But not allowing yourself to know is the is a way of coping and surviving against the trauma. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. 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 So I'll say it again. Uh, not allowing yourself to know doesn't mean that you're not traumatized. It means that you're helping yourself survive against knowing about the real trauma. Yeah. Now there are many techniques to get to those memories 
to get to those parts of the self which have been cut off through dissociation or, or splitting of the self so the person can survive. And, you know, if we go back many, many years ago about when I came, came into therapy, you know, myself and started to train as a therapist, one of the major ways of dealing with trauma back then was what was called debriefing. Yes. Now, I know you know a little bit about this because good connection and work with people in the armed forces but if you go back in time and still maybe now uh, debriefing is one of the major techniques of helping person deal with trauma now what is debriefing debriefing in many ways is helping the person repetitively specifically going over what they can remember yeah so they say same thing over and over and over and over and over again. So if that's so, for example, if they are, let's take the armed force. Somebody's come back from, say, could be any war tour place, but and they've been in, say, uh, you know, an armed truck which blew up or something. So you would take them to what they can remember and start there and and get them to cognitively go over what they can remember. And gradually, as you do that specifically, and they start to debrief, they start to remember more and more and more. Or if they can't remember more and more and more, that technique, technique may lead them to emotions. The idea is to get the story and to get the connections between thinking and feeling so the person has a sense of understanding the whole. Yeah. And that was called debriefing. Is that how you understand debriefing? Yes, yeah, yeah. When you were speaking, I was thinking, I don't know whether things have changed, you know, recently around sort of mental health first aid. And, you know, like in America, if they've had a shooting in a school or whatever, then there's like batches of counsellors and psychotherapists go in kind of within 24, 48 hours yeah. to, to allow them to do that. And I was just thinking, is that so that the separation stuff doesn't kind of set in as a protection mechanism? If, if they're talking, they're, they're kind of yeah. keeping it in their consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So what the armed forces wasn't very good at doing Let's take the army, but I'm going to say armed forces here. A person does a tour of Ireland, and the island in my day was when a lot of the trauma was, and they'd come back, and the army might say, right, let's do three weeks of debriefing or whatever, ever time. But they call it decompression now, Bob. Well, see, it shows my age. <laughs> um, but they, they didn't do it very quickly, and they didn't do it long enough. No. And um, that was the problem. But you are right. You are correct. We've moved on and you get all the things you've just talked about there with the purpose of enabling the person very quickly to cathartically talk about their thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yes. And to teach them sort of emotional first aid. Yeah. It's kind of like with the Manchester bombing attack. Do you know what I mean? There was there was that much put in place quite early on. As in, yeah, you know, know, what annoys me most is that somebody uh, comes out of, say, the one of those bombings that you talked about, and then a reporter says, well, what were you feeling? No, they have no yeah. ability to, know, to be able to process. So what they do often in an attempt to ask that very silly question is to go to a cognitive answer to that question and they appear dissociated zombies but in fact they're, they're attempting to cope with what was unimaginable yes yeah so when these people do flood in from the emergency services they will have been hopefully taught to we'll say decompress or debrief in, in, in whatever it was but it's to help them really um connect uh, uh, the different parts of themselves which they've disconnected to survive yeah. yeah yeah and I think that survival part of it is really important that they're doing what they need to do in that moment to survive mm -hmm. yeah so another another take a more 
modern technique which is to use is EMDR. Yes, yeah. So I, I thought, you know, I'm not an expert in EMDR, but it means eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a modern, much more modern uh, technique for dealing with trauma and to help the person um, through looking at the rapid movement of their um, the, the process of their, their eyes, if you want to look at it that way. But it's the same thing. It's helping the person get to um, be able to process the, the disconnections between thinking, feeling, behavior through the eyes. Yeah. So EMDR is taught uh, very extensively and very successfully, I think, as a way in to helping the person deal with trauma. Yeah. And for me, you know, any anything, when we're not two D, you know, beings, we are three D, and some things work for some people, and other things don't. And you know, for me, I think any any tools that we can have in our toolbox that are going to aid the client is brilliant. I I love transactional analysis, but I'm not precious about it's the only thing that's going to work. Some people need different techniques. Some people need different methods. Yeah, because if if we think about it this way, that for a person psychologically to deal with trauma, what happens instinctively is they, they cut off from that trauma yeah. to survive. Yeah. But the cost of that is that they give away spontaneity. They give away part of themselves. Yeah. And they shut off the trauma and spend a lot of energy sh shutting off the trauma. Yeah, and keeping it short. <laughs> they, yeah. And maintaining it. That That's right. Yeah. So whether it's EMDR, though, whether it's debriefing, whether it's hypnotic induction, yeah. any of these techniques we talk about, they're all the same. In the, the end result is all go, always going to be the same to help the person make connections with parts of the self that they've split off with yeah. to enable themselves to cope with dealing with the trauma. Yeah. So yes, you're absolutely correct. How we get there is going to be different with the many individuals, but the end goal is to yeah. help them become whole yeah. and to process the trauma. And to do that, you've got to get to the part, get to enable the person to get to the parts of the self which they've split off. Yes, yeah. And that will take time. One of the real lessons I learned in dealing with people who traumatized, and it was a big lesson for me, is that I went, I used to go far too quickly in the early days. And the problem with that is that the person then can easily get overwhelmed and go underground and split off even further. And you may never know it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it needs to be really slow steps with debriefing um, you would spend many 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 sessions going specifically over th things in a very repetitive way to hopefully get to different or get alongside different layers a bit like peeling an onion yes to the next layer yeah emdr same thing hypnotic induction the same thing and then eventually of course helping them attempt to understand the un un understandable which is a really strong uh, process and you know sometimes uh, in the, you know you have to move to what i would call spiritual to bring a spiritual part into this because some things are not explainable yeah yeah and that can be quite difficult for some clients very yeah. What, what, yes. what your understanding of yeah, yeah. is. Yeah. That's right. However, I do believe, and I've not come across a person that 
if you change the language as a therapist, you can get to the inner inner part of yourself, the higher being. We could change languages. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the important thing. Yeah. Uh, there, there isn't a client that I, I haven't met a client who hasn't believed or hasn't had a sense of part of themselves which is external to themselves. In other words, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a higher being. It yeah. could be in a part of the self. It could be yeah. the inner child. It could. Be, we can find many different languages. Yeah, yeah. No. And again, th that comes with knowing the client, the language to use that's that's going to resonate for them. Yeah. Yes, but yes, yes. And if you are rushed in to do uh, trauma work, people like at the Manchester Boeing, we're just talking about a moment, or the what you just talked about, mouths in America, whatever. They might ask that question. They, yeah. they might say, "Do you have do you have a belief in God?" Yeah. In an attempt to find a way of meeting the client because some things are un, unexplainable yeah. without a spiritual connection in some way. Yeah. And often, you, you know, we, with trauma, do you think that that's what people are looking for, an answer? <laughs> when you say yes, that some yes, things aren't, yes. we can't yes. explain. I think most people I've ever met so I suppose I'm saying 100%, but I would say definitely most people I've met, they need not so much an, an answer, Jackie, but a, uh, a way of understanding what's happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think we... we yes. I think it's a way of understanding. What's, and if we can't get to that place, that is where we may move to some aspect of a higher self or a spiritual understanding or inner self or whatever language you want to use in an attempt to help the thriver survivor understand what was ununderstandable. Un yeah yeah one of the things i talk with clients about not necessarily around trauma but often is that you know our our brain or our mind needs to make connections and i think that's Part of, if it can't hang it on something or connect it to something, we kind of flounder. Oh. So yeah. having that spiritual, you know, bigger than us, what's the point type of conversation can be quite helpful, very helpful, yeah. Now, to get there, you have to go through the trauma first to get there, but down the line, yes. Yeah, yeah. And in a way, from the beginning, most clients I've ever seen are really talking about trauma. Of one form or another, yeah. I used, you know, for a very, 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 very long time in, as a therapist, I used to believe all trauma was a bit like poison. In other words, you can take a beaker of poison or a drop of poison and it's still trauma. However, I have come down to recognise that some trauma is so huge, unimaginable, that uh, it takes a different level of processing. Yeah. But if we just take the most clients you ever see, you'll be dealing with trauma. You know, I just had an assessment today with somebody who's, from the beginning to the end, was just was talking about loss and trauma. Uh, you know, dad had died two years ago and... But, you know, we could go on and on. More clients you see will really be talking about some form of trauma, loss or change. Yeah. How we deal with it. Number one place, of course, is listening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, did, then we start to help them look at what they've given up to cope. And usually what they've given up to cope is they split off, they've split off part of themselves. Yeah. And that's and what the third It makes perfect do. sense why you would do that. Well, to survive, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Survive, yeah, absolutely. But you know, clients that, 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 from my experience, you know, why would I why why would I do that? And to try and you know, again, it's not the, the guilt and the blame and the shame and everything. It's it's like you did that so you would survive. Mm. But, now in the here and now there's a better way of you to manage 
by connecting with that split off part and integrating and moving forward that way. But it's, it's done its thing because you're still here. What you're going to come across usually first is denial. Yeah. And uh, the best way to deal with denial is to listen to their story. Yeah, which again can take a long time. Yeah, timing is the key Yeah, as a psychotherapist. You can't teach timing, actually. I don't believe you can. You can... You can talk about timing. I've been trained to be, I've been training therapists for a very, very long time, and I've been talking about timing for 30 years. But until class starts, sorry, until therapists start to see clients, I don't think they really fully appreciate what I've ever been talking about. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> actually, Understandably, it's like when you learn how to drive, you can be taught the mechanics, but getting in a car and actually driving is a whole different ball game. So it, it 100% agree, yeah. Timing is something which you learn by experience. Mm. But with trauma, it is essential to learn, you know, about the importance of when to say things and when to listen and when not to say things. Yeah. And I suppose maybe if there are any people listening here that are trainees or, you know, early on in, in the therapy career, it's about, you know, being confident in knowing where your limits are <laughs> and, and not taking on certain clients in the oh, early I've days. You know, that 80-20 rule of, you know. Well, you can only take on clients, I think, that you've been trained to deal with. Yeah. And, you know, one tip would be to, to shut up if you can't think about what to say. In other words, to listen, 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 listen and to inquire, inquire, inquire. But certainly, with this, if, if you feel you, uh, out of your depth of people, then I think you need to refer on. Yeah. And that's another whole aspect of training. So we're dealing, therapists will deal with trauma every day. Yes. Every client they ever see, they are dealing with different levels of trauma. Yeah. Yeah, and I like that analogy that you said about, you know, that you can take a lot of poison or a little bit of poison. It's still trauma. It's still trauma, yeah, yeah. And everybody has a different capacity to, you know, to overcome things. Well, you see, that's another story. <laughs> I, oh, I, was, I thought you were going to talk about the how the therapist protects themselves from taking the vicarious trauma on, which is perhaps another podcast, but you meant... Uh, something very different from that yeah but that that is a really valid point you know a, a, again uh, well something I wrote down when you were talking right at the very beginning of this was you know trauma can be a person going through a trauma or yeah. the observer if somebody's observed a trauma yeah. that also is you know worth looking at as well oh, very traumatic I remember one of the most traumatic, one of the most tra traumatic times in my life was when I found the found the body of somebody I knew and had known for many years um, kill herself. Yeah. And I found the body, and that was one of the most traumatic times in my life. So, you know, uh, therapists need to take themselves to uh, therapists. In other words, what I mean, if they feel vicarious trauma. Um, or there's some sort of uh, triggers to their own traumatic history, they need to go into their own therapy. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And that's a really, really important thing, perhaps another podcast, is how therapists protect themselves from, you know, vicarious trauma. Yeah. I think it is a really good topic for a podcast. <laughs> mm. So you can put that on the list. I'm, I'm putting it because we, 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 we've we run out of the list now, Bob. We don't have anything left on oh, the list. We do. We, have. we don't. Me, me whiteboard's empty. We have nothing left on the list now. Oh, well, I'm going to give you a few more. But um, how are we getting on with trauma? Is there anything else to sort of... I think, I think that's... I think we've covered mm. over the, the last two podcasts. I think we've covered lots of things. And I think it's a nice place to end. You know, what do we do to protect ourselves? I think... Mm. We're talking a lot about the clients, but as far as the the, the therapist working with, because we've done narcissistic borderline, 
you know, we, we've gone through an awful lot of clients now. Maybe we can turn it around and look on. on the yeah, I, I did not come out of the list, but I can think of many more. You know, one of the areas which I think uh, that you know a lot about and Steph knows a lot about, and she said she quietly, as my wife could do another podcast, was working with children. Yeah, yeah. That's, how about making that the next one? Maybe that is a good one because, you know, with with the 18 months, two years that we've had, I think it's impacted an awful lot on our younger generation. Yeah, yeah. And what about eating disorders? Yes. Let's make those the next two. Okay. Steph says she'd quite happily do the child one. Yeah. If you'd have her on again. Of course I would. She's yeah. welcome anytime. And then I can happily talk about, I don't happily, but I can certainly talk about what, how we work with eating disorders for my frame of reference. Okay. So those are the next two topics for the listeners. We'll do, we'll do working with children and then eating disorders. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much again, Bob. You're welcome. A wealth of information. <laughs> thank you very Seriously, much. Seriously, I learn something new every time we talk. So I want to say thank you for that. Do I, so thank you. Okay. Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.